whatever. So the little girl's whereabouts were unknown, and this ever-evolving story from Nance, you know, just uh, had Lizzie concerned. And, of course, I guess others, probably the Putnams and neighbors, uh, concerned about this child's fate. And I guess at some point, Lizzie maybe even sent a letter out to the county home with a neighbor and ended up getting word back that the county home had no child in their care, nor did they even take children. Uh oh. The county home was reserved strictly for elderly people, and they didn't, they weren't in the, you know, adoption or fostering or, you know, orphanage business. So now they're going to be wondering where in the world is the little girl? Right. Two years old, went off with her grandmother, and never she's returned. She's telling different stories. Yeah, which is never good. No. So eventually, the Haywood County Sheriff. A man named Jack Carver stepped in and began a search for the child. Now, since she couldn't be found, Nance, Lizzie, and Will Putnam were placed in jail. Lizzie actually gave birth to her son, her second child, while she was in the sheriff's custody. So by April, now you got to consider this happened back in February. So by April, of course, the weather had warmed up, snow had melted at those higher elevations. Um, You know, people could get out, start doing some searches. So the trio was still in jail as search parties began combing the area of Utah Mountain around kind of where the family, you know, had lived. And um, a 16-year-old kid named Frank James uh, was out on the search party or, you know, out with the search party, out on the trail looking for this little girl. And he had a dog with him. And the dog actually led them to a cave at what is called Adtate Knob. And I was trying to remember the name of that earlier, but Adtate Knob, which is on Utah Mountain. Yeah, I've never heard of that knob. Well, the crevice where the cave was had some rocks, and some even described boulders, like, lodged in front of the entrance. And I guess they, you know, maybe were even smelling something once they got up there. The dog's going nuts. So they know they've got to check this cave. Well, from what I've read online, it took several strong men to pull rocks away and expose the doom beyond. So there they found this decaying corpse of this two-year-old little girl, Roberta Ann Putnam, and her small body was wearing layers of dresses Because, of course, when they had set out on foot, it was February. It was cold. These are poor people. They probably don't have winter coats, winter shoes, all of those things for a little girl. Could you imagine? So I'm assuming her mother, maybe her grandmother, layered her up in these dresses in hopes that that would keep her warm. So, you know, it was like they were careful enough and attentive enough to dress this child for the weather. But, you know, just, just a sad little fact there, little detail. So, of course, you know, the three are in jail. They find the body of this little child. So, word, word, I can't talk today, word traveled through the valleys and up, you know, the ridges all over about what had become of this missing toddler. And then, of course, the speculations, rumors began swirling. Some people believe that Will and Lizzie had actually placed the child inside the cave um, because, you know, you look at this old lady, she's like 65 frail probably not in good condition you got to consider the time poor oh. probably not you know very well um you know probably not in great health probably mal- a little malnourished because yeah, they're sure. poor and you know probably not looking her best i mean i think 65 today is not as old as Not it was 150 back then yeah. a long time exactly like <laughs> this was this woman was basically on you probably on death's door probably had a damn foot in the grave so how she put them it. big ass rocks in front well, of the cave that's what people have always wanted to know is did she have help how did an elderly woman do this by herself i mean i've seen pictures of nancy she was like not a big lady it was not like this was a bodybuilder she was a tiny frail withered Little old lady. So how in the world did she move those big rocks in front of that cave door? So a lot of people have said, you know, they really think that Will Putnam was involved or that Lizzie had help. Or I'm sorry, that Nance had help, maybe from Lizzie, maybe from Will, maybe the three of them, that there could have been like multiple people involved. But no one 
spoke about it. I mean, it was like, if that was the case, it was tight-lipped. They can never prove who put those rocks there. So that's always been kind of, a, I guess, an element of the story that's really played into that legend. So when they began, you know, trying to get a jury together, no jury could be seated in Haywood County because everybody had heard the story. Everybody already had an opinion on it that they were trying to seat on this jury and people were angry. It's funny. Even back then, you know, like nowadays with the media and everything moves so fast. But even back then, something like that happens in an area. People talk and you can't find, you know, a, a impartial jury, if you will. So they move a county over, which is like a world away. Yeah, kinda. which is exactly what happened. So the judge decided to move the trial over to the neighboring Swain County to the courthouse in, like, in what is, you know, Bryson City. And the move almost didn't happen. Just reading some reports and uh, news articles and that kind of thing, there was an angry lynch mob wow. that basically showed up at the jail ready to clobber Nance, Will, Lizzie. I mean, they were ready for what we call mountain justice. Mountain justice. Oh, yeah. No trial. We're going to hang these people high. Well, after the trial, Nance pled guilty to second degree murder. Or, I'm sorry, yeah, at the trial. So she pleads guilty. She was sentenced to 30 years in the state women's prison in Raleigh. And that would have been March 1914. So the child was discovered in April. The trial happened pretty quickly. So by March, you know, less than a year later, basically, from the discovery of the body, she's on her way to prison. So she serves 15 years in prison, and then she's released. So she did half the sentence. But she was 80 years old when they finally let her out of prison, right? So I guess they assumed she would no longer be a danger at 80. Right. I don't know. Well, Nance returned to her previous home on Jonathan Creek. And now this is a detail that I don't know exactly if this is fact or fiction, because there have been several books, plays, stories, you know, kind of passed down, written about this. But one of the um, stories that I had found was that apparently Nance had a $10 bill, which I guess was what the state gave you, like when you got out of prison. Like, here you go, here's 10 bucks, go start a new life kind of thing. And I guess she returned to Jonathan Creek, gave that $10 to her daughter, and then disappeared. Right? Left her home for good. Well, she moved over to Conley's Creek, which is an area of Bryson City. And she lived in a shack there alone for about 24 years before she died. Wow. So she was 80 and lived another 24 years. So she died at the age of 104. Wow. Tough this old is bird. a unique fact. So my family, my father's family, my paternal grandfather, my great grandmother, they were from Swain County. And my great grandmother's family lived up Conley's Creek for years and years and years. I believe as a, you know, a child, my grandfather lived Conley's Creek. I mean, I've been up to that area time and time again. We fly fish up there, had family up that way, you know. And so my great grandmother was alive, of course, at this time when Nance Dude moved up to Conley's Creek. And when I was a kid, up until, you know, my granny died, she would tell me this story because we would talk a little bit. She was she was kind of interested in local stories and legends. So we would chat a bit about this Nance Dude story because, like I said, it's something that I heard my whole life, this story about Nance Dude and what she had done. So my great-grandmother remembers Nancy Dude living on Conley's Creek and that she had these black labs, like these big black dogs, and that she would walk up and down the road, you know, doing whatever, and when my great-grandmother and her brother would see Nance coming, my, gra my great-grandmother, I called her Granny, she would jump in a cornfield that was by the road with her brother. And she said they would hide. They would, like, crouch down and hide until Nance had passed because they were afraid of her. Because, of course, everybody knew what she had done. Yeah, I'm sure everybody talked till the day she died. And everybody called her a witch. Mm. And so... You know, my great grandmother and her brother Ike would hide out in this cornfield, wait for her to pass because she was like, We were so terrified. We didn't want to pass by her. We didn't want to look her in the eye. 
Like, we really, truly thought this woman was a witch and that she was going to somehow kill us. Hmm. And that whole legend about the witch, actually, people in Haywood County were saying that about her at the time. Because they were like, how in the world did this little old lady move all these rocks and whatever? So that was another kind of rumor that swirled was she's a witch. And it was witchcraft. What's the wonder they didn't burn her? Kid up in this cave, right? So I just thought that was kind of a unique element to the story about Nance Dude, that little familial connection. So, of course, throughout the trial, Nance never offered up any kind of remorse. She never showed any sort of emotion about the granddaughter dying, about her involvement, never any kind of justification, really, for what had happened. I mean, and people were just astounded. I mean, how does your granddaughter die this horrible death alone in a cave starved to death starved to death in the cold the elements probably you know frostbite yeah who knows all that horrible stuff how could you do that yeah exactly i mean even if you're in a bad way you know i just don't know how you can leave a little one behind like that yeah i mean it's horrific yeah and And for them asking probably hollering and screaming while you're Blocking them in this cave? Yeah. Scared? I mean, just the whole thing is terrible. It's Mm. so gruesome. And, yeah. But, you know, people were just like, what the fuck? I mean, she never seemed sad. And even if she was innocent and really hadn't done this, she wouldn't she have shown some emotion and been like, You'd be all to hell. Oh, this is horrible. I can't believe this is happening. But she was just cool as a cucumber, as they say. So the truth ultimately died with Nance Dude. She's buried somewhere outside of Bryson City in Bumgarner Cemetery, which I think is maybe around Whittier. And Roberta is buried in the Delwood Cemetery. And Will and Lizzie died later. So I guess Will died in 1955 and Lizzie died in 1969. So, of course, the three people involved in this have passed. And the cave where Roberta Putnam lost her life is on private property, but I guess it's still a destination for, of course, local lore, teenagers, and morbid curiosity seekers. So a lot of people want to go up to the cave. And I know when I was young, I mean, I've, like I said, I've heard this story my whole life. Grandmothers told me this story. Great-grandmother. My mom knows this story. I mean, it's just like, if you're from Haywood County, if you are a true local, yep. then you know this story. Would you go to see the cave? Have you seen it? I haven't, but I have known people like when I was in high school, like friends and, you know, kids that would go up there and it was like a thing to do. Right. You know, and of course I heard stories like, oh, if you go up there at night, you can hear a little girl crying. And, yeah. You know, of course, those stories. That's probably the beers. The beers. Yeah. The mm-hmm. beers was making them hear people crying. And the cheap weed. And the weed. Yeah. Crappy weed. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I've never been up there. Yeah, well, maybe we'll go find it. But I have heard that in the winter when they're, you know, the leaves are off the trees that you can see it from the road. Oh, yeah? Or from okay. certain places. So, I don't know. I've never really checked. Just such a sad story. It is very sad. Very sad. A little one lost their life there. Yeah. and there, Starved to death. Like I said, there have Elements. been a couple of uh, stories written. Um, there's a book by Maurice Stanley, which is a work of fiction, but... It's rooted in a lot of fact. Right. And he's just sort of added, of course, some conversation and some little things here and there, I guess, to make the story a bit more interesting or kind of, you know, had some creative freedom with that. There's a song about Roberta and Nance Dude called Poor Child, which I guess some local bluegrass um, folks have performed. Huh. Because, you know, we got to have us a good murder ballad. Yep. To go along with our story. That's just what happens. And then there was a play written by a a Silva man named Gary Carden, and it's called Nance Dude. And I actually have found a clip of that play, and we may play some audio from that. Wow, I'd like to see that. We'll include a little bit of audio in our podcast just to kind of give people an extra something. That sounds cool. I want to see that. Yeah. And so I guess the Nance Dude play has been performed up in Highlands, here in Silva, I think maybe throughout the Southeast. So maybe if you ever have a chance to check that out, it's a one woman play. And uh, the version that we actually have a little clip from uh, stars Elizabeth Westall. And it was from back in 2009. Mm. 
but 